Good morning everyone and welcome back to my channel. Coffee in the morning is just a necessity. I don't know who you are and what you do, but if you don't have coffee in the morning, I don't trust you. I'm kidding. <laughs> Let's get started with the day. I just spent 10 minutes trying to connect my wireless Bluetooth keyboard to my computer and it still doesn't work. Corporate Bluetooth is something else. Oh, I managed to connect my keyboard now. I have no idea how. At least it works. So usually in the morning I catch up on stock messages and I check my emails and my calendar. In my team we do have a daily stand-up, but that's only at 10.45 a.m. So there's plenty of time until it starts. Today I actually have an important meeting at 9 a.m. So I started working a bit earlier, but usually I start between 9 and 9.30. The project I'm working on right now has some data quality issues, so I need to do some investigations. Honestly, the most difficult projects are usually the ones that have a lot of ambiguity. Making sure that you are answering the right questions or actually solving the problem that you think you're solving is sometimes even more difficult than creating or coding the solution itself. Okay, I think I'm gonna take a lunch break now. I'm gonna heat up some pasta for lunch. This is actually meal prepped. I need to show you guys something. I created a recipe board to be more efficient with my meals. I'm gonna show you. So I created this board last weekend on Notion. It contains some workspaces with areas of my life where I just like to keep organized. So I have some where I write down my goals. I have one for CS Jackie, which is all of my social media. I have one for self-development. Well, I started therapy recently, mostly for anxiety. And this is, for example, where I keep my therapy notes. But what I really wanted to show you is the cooking workspace. I found this template online and I simply adapted it a bit. But I basically created a recipe box where I keep track of all the recipes that I like. For example, I learned this recipe from my sister, so I have all of the instructions and the shopping list here. And this is honestly so helpful because all of the recipes are just in one place and it makes it, I don't know, just so much easier and more time efficient. Whenever I feel like eating something, I kind of just look up what I have on my recipes and I pick something from there. So this is definitely a productivity hack that I can recommend. So the reason I actually created this board in the first place was because Acer recently invited me to participate in their sustainability challenge, which is a challenge that they were running across their community. So as a sponsor of this portion of the video, Acer has very kindly offered to support my challenge, which is 21 days of sustainable eating. I picked this challenge because I've been unorganized with my meals before and I hate wasting food. So that's why I created this recipe board and it's honestly been very helpful in avoiding decision fatigue and it also saves me a lot of time. And this Chromebook you see over here is the Acer Chromebook Vero 514. It is a unique computer made out of recycled plastic. It's a pretty cool concept because the chassis and the screen basil are made of 30% PCR2 plastic, whereas the keycaps and the audio speakers are made of 50% PCR2 plastic. The touchpad itself, it's made out of recycled ocean-bound plastic. This Chromebook is one of a kind and it's available at a very affordable price point. The Vera Chromebook 514 comes with a powerful Intel Core i3 or i5 processor and up to 256GB of storage. It also comes with built-in virus protection so you don't have to worry about buying that. It's a laptop that should last you a long time and can run for up to 10 hours on a single charge. You can take it with you while you're out and about and at just 1.4kg it won't weigh you down. I honestly think it's a very innovative concept so big thank you to Acer for sending me this Chromebook and letting me try it out. And in addition it's also an environmentally conscious choice. I will leave a link in the description so you can check it out if you're interested. And now let's go and have lunch. I mentioned this before, I'm sure most of you are aware, but I'm currently at my boyfriend's house for a few weeks because my new apartment is only available in May and I moved out of my previous apartment in March. So he took me in and I assembled this temporary setup. It makes a big difference on my productivity levels, to be honest, so I'm glad that I made the decision to set this up for the few weeks that I was here. 
My lease starts this week and I'm moving into the apartment very very soon and that's going to be the next video that you will see. It's going to be my moving vlog and my apartment tour. I'm very excited to share it with you so yeah stay tuned for that. So as you guys know I like to include technical content into my vlogs and this one is no exception and today we're doing another system design exercise. I thought it could be interesting to look into auto completion systems for example when we access google.com and we type in a query in our search box the system will return some autocomplete suggestions and today we're going to look into how to design such a system so these are the requirements of the system first we want to have five autocomplete suggestions the suggestion should be ranked by popularity we consider that spell checking is out of scope we will consider only the english language we will assume that the system has 5 million daily users on average and the system needs to be highly available and have low latency. So first of all, we need to do a scale estimation. For 5 million users, let's assume that on average each user does 10 searches per day. Let's assume that one character is one byte and that one query has four words and that one word has six characters. So 4 times 6 times 1 byte is 24 bytes per query and 10 searches a day times 24 bytes is 240 bytes per user per day. So 240 times 5 million divided by 24 and divided by 3600, 14,000 queries per second on average. We can assume that peak traffic is double that of the average traffic, so that is 28,000 queries per second at peak. And I left this note here in the corner, just to keep in mind that for each character in a certain word, we send one autocomplete request. So the word hello would have five requests. Now let's design the autocomplete system. This is actually broken down into two subsystems. First of all, we need to look into the query service. This is the service that will return the five most frequently searched terms for a given prefix. And then we need a second service to actually count, aggregate, and store the search terms and how frequently they're searched for. And this I would call the search frequency storage service. Let's start with the query service. On a very high level, this is how it could work. We have our users that type words in the search bar. Each character will send a request to the load balancer. The load balancer will redirect the request to a certain API server. The API server will check in the try cache if the prefix is available. And if so, it will check what are the five most commonly searched terms for this prefix and it will return them to the user. If the prefix is not stored in the cache, it will get it from the database. And at the same time, the system should also write to the cache what are, for this given prefix, the five most commonly searched terms. This is how it could work on a high level, but we need to understand a bit better how to compute these five terms. And for that, we need to understand tries. Let's think about the storage solution. So the ideal data structure to implement an autocomplete system is actually a try. A try is actually a tree data structure, but it is used in a very specific way. Usually the root node is an empty string and every child of the root node is a character in the alphabet. And the children of the first line of children from the root complement the first letter with uh, another letter that can be joined to it to form a word or to form a prefix for another word. So for example, we have T that becomes two or it becomes T, which can become T or Ted or 10. And what we're gonna do in this try is that in each node, we will store the string, which is the character or the word, and the associated frequency if it's a term that has been searched before. For example, T has been searched 11 times so far. All the nodes that are not leaf nodes, meaning the parent nodes, will have a cache associated to them with the top K most searched terms. In our case, this is the five most searched terms. And this is how we can make the system very efficient. Let's think about the time complexity to look for the five most searched terms given a certain prefix. Let's think about it with this cache and without this cache. Let's assume that T is the length of the prefix that we're looking for and C is the number of children of a given node. So without having the cache, the time complexity to retrieve these five elements would be O of T plus O of C plus O of C logarithm of C. So let's break this down. Let's say that the word is we, W-I. We would need to traverse the try until we find we, so one, two, and then we would have to check all of the children of this node. So this would be O of T until we get to this step, and then we would have to traverse all the children of this node. So this is O of C. So then we know the children are win and wit, 
and then we would have to sort these by frequency. So this is the component of O of C, logarithm of C, because we would have to sort C number of components. And this is how we get to this time complexity. But if we pre-compute this order and we store it in a cache, then at every step of the way, we don't need to do the sorting and we don't need to look for the children of a certain node. So all we had to do was to traverse up to here and then read the cache in O of 1. So the time complexity is O of t, where t is the length of the prefix that we're looking for, which is v. But if we consider that t is limited, which makes sense because we're dealing with an English alphabet, then we can say that this is actually constant time O of 1. We are definitely doing a trade-off here. We are sacrificing on space in order to save on time and make it more time efficient. Now let's talk about the second component of our system, which is the search frequency storage service. I know it's quite a long name. <laughs> I think there's some room for our improvement here. Every time a user searches for a certain keyword, we could technically update our system to count for it. The problem is that doing this in real time is not very scalable. So a better way to do this is to batch an update. So what we could do is keep some logs of the searches that are executed in our system. And this is what they would look like, just a simple record that states the search term and the timestamp when the search happened. Once a day or once a week or once a month, we run an aggregator on it and we count these search terms. So the aggregator would be like a batch processing system that aggregates the counts and stores them in a database. And this would be sort of like a cron job. We have the search term, we have a timestamp, and we have a frequency. And we know exactly how much time elapsed in between each aggregated data snapshot. So in between the starting timestamp and when the snapshot was taken, we know that TED was searched for twice, T was searched for twice, and WIN was searched for once. And this is then stored in a database. And then we need to have a try builder. So this should be a service or a job that basically builds the try with the updated aggregated data. And once the try is built, we can store a snapshot of this try in a document database and then store a snapshot of that in the cache to make sure that the cache is up to date. Alternatively, it's also possible to use a key value pair database and do a mapping between the frequencies and the prefixes. And this is the try database and the cache that our previous system would then read, namely the query service here. So that's it for today's system design exercise. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you like this format with the notes. I kind of had a lot of fun doing this, especially because the notebook was new and I just can't not scribble on a new notebook. And I would also love to hear your thoughts on the system and if you think there's something that could be improved or modified, let me know in the comments. Here's Java. I think I'm gonna end the vlog here. I'm just gonna read a bit in bed and then I'll go to sleep. Thank you so much for watching. I love you all and I'll see you in my next vlog, which is my moving vlog. Bye.